Welcome to Scriptura's layer-by-layer overview of Psalm 19. The psalm begins with the words, The sky is declaring God's honor, and ends with a prayer, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable before the Lord. Between these opening words about the sky and this closing prayer, we read that the Lord's instruction is perfect, restoring life. These words show us the journey of Psalm 19, which reveals that from the huge and distant sky to the close and secret human heart, nothing is hidden from God. The instruction of the Lord exposes the human heart like the sun exposes everything on earth. It could be a cause for despair to have the true condition of the human heart revealed. But it is not because the Lord is a rock and a redeemer. He forgives sins and makes the human heart acceptable. The phrase, nothing is hidden, captures this core of the psalm and ties together all three sections. It begins with what people all over the earth see in the sky and ends with what each individual fears will be seen in his or her heart through the Lord's instruction. It is wonderful and terrifying that nothing is hidden. The poem begins with celebrating how the sky praises God the same way a poet would praise him, by declaring his honor. The message of the sky reaches everywhere. Not a word of the sky's poem is lost. The endless rhythm of day and night reminds us that the Creator is honored always and everywhere. The sun has the lead role in the sky's poem. The sun is responsible for traveling the full expanse of the sky every day, exposing everything. Nothing can hide from the sun's heat. The fool of Proverbs denies how much God knows. But David has the opposite wise perspective. He rejoices that God's honor is everywhere and that God's knowledge and power are like the sun. The sun rejoices to do its role and David stands in awe of the majesty and greatness of the sky and the sun. The vulnerability of everything on earth shows the power of the sun. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The sun reaches perfectly to everywhere on earth, bringing light and heat. In a similar way, the instruction of the Lord reaches to every human heart. It is perfect, bringing life, causing joy, and making people wise. This is good, desirable, and sweet, like the warmth of the sun. But Just like everything uncovered is vulnerable to the sun's intense heat, the perfection of God's instruction leaves the psalmist feeling his own vulnerability. In verse 12, the tone of the poem changes significantly to focus on the reason for this vulnerability. David feels the heat and the effect of the Lord's instruction. David can celebrate how much he desires the perfection of the Lord's instruction, but at the same time, he feels the effect on his uncovered and vulnerable heart. The Lord's instruction exposes sin, mistakes, and even crime. The Lord's instruction is perfect, but he, David, is not. This leads to distress, because he is someone who tries to follow the Lord, but recognizes he is not worthy. He desperately needs the Lord to take away his guilt and protect him from sin. In verse 15, he feels hope that meets and goes beyond his distress. The Lord's instruction reveals his own guilt, but his relationship with the Lord, that covenantal relationship we always see in a psalm by David, means he has hope of forgiveness and restoration. He can therefore end the poem praying with confidence that his own words and the meditation of his own heart be acceptable to the Lord. He knows the Lord will accept them because he is his rock, his safe place from those who try to rule over him, and his redeemer, 
the one who restores him from his sinful condition into righteousness once again. What begins as a hymn of praise, with the sky declaring God's honor, ends with a prayer for forgiveness. David asks God to make him blameless. Once God makes him blameless, his words will be an acceptable offering to God, declaring God's honor as his rock and redeemer. It's an emotional journey from joy and awe through vulnerability and distress, but ending in hope. We'll now walk through the psalm section by section, beginning with verses 1 to 7. For the Director, a psalm by David. The sky is declaring God's honor, and the firmament is telling about the workmanship of his hands. Day after day pours out speech, and night after night imparts knowledge. There is no speech, and there are no words whose sound is not being heard. Its verse line has gone forth throughout the whole earth, and its words have gone forth throughout the edge of the world. He has set up in it a home for the sun, and he is like a bridegroom coming out of his tent. He is glad like a warrior to run his course. His starting point is from the edge of the sky, and his turning point is at its edges, and nothing is hidden from his heat. Before the first section begins, we have the superscription in verse 1. It explicitly says the psalm is by David, which means we should read it as a psalm from God's anointed, the king over Israel. The king had a covenant relationship with the Lord, which included the obligations of a son to obey his father, as well as the obligations of a father to care for his son. This covenant relationship makes David confident that the Lord will forgive him when he asks. And this confidence is the foundation of the entire message of this psalm. The first section, the words of the sky, is verses 2 to 7. This section talks about how the sky declares the Lord's honor. It both begins and ends with the word sky in verses 2 and 7. Hebrew poems often mark the boundaries of sections by using a repeated word, a feature scholars call an inclusio. The first image in Psalm 19 is the sky as a poet, singing about how God deserves honor. A poet uses rhythm and song to communicate. In the same way, the sky uses the rhythm of day and night to sing about how we can depend on God, just as we can depend on the sun to appear every day. The sky uses the sequence of night and day to pour out speech and reveal knowledge. It is like a poet who never stops reciting or singing his poetry. This poem is not for a private audience, however. It is for everyone, everywhere. No one can ignore it. Every word of the sky's poem is heard by everyone across the entire earth. Indeed, every line of poetry goes out to be heard by everyone throughout the whole earth. The words of each line go out to the very edge of the world, just like the sky. The artistry of this poem captures the power and beauty of the sky's rhythm and the sun's faithful appearance. David marvels at the power and beauty of creation in Psalm 8 as well. But the repeated point in this poem is just how far the sky's declaration of God's honor goes. It reaches everywhere, and everyone hears it. God's honor has no boundaries, and he has displayed his honor for everyone to see in the sky. At the end of verse 5, we see the sun is a main character in the poem, the source of the heat in the sequence of day and night. The psalm introduces the sun quite suddenly, in the middle of the discussion of the poem that goes out everywhere. In it, the sky... God has set up a home for the sun. Two images are used to describe the role of the sun. First, it is like a bridegroom coming out of his tent. This is a picture of a newly married bridegroom, the morning after the wedding, 
coming out of the tent where he has taken his bride to consummate their marriage. It is a picture of radiance and exuberance, a moment the culture considered the most joyful moment. Speaking of bride and bridegroom was a typical way of reminding people of community joy and rejoicing about a blessed life. The son is dressed in splendid clothing, like a bridegroom would be splendidly dressed and full of joy for his wedding. The image then shifts to a warrior who is eager to do his work for the day. The warrior goes out to fight, bringing terror to the enemies he defeats and joy to the people he saves. The warrior is deadly to anyone he fights who is unprotected. Like a warrior performing amazing feats in a long battle, the sun starts at one end of the sky and goes all the way to the other end, with nothing hidden from its heat. The heat of the sun is inescapable and deadly to everyone who is unprotected. The image of the warrior conveys this danger. These two images close out the section on the sky with the twin themes of this psalm the joy of the bridegroom, and the danger of the fierce warrior. The rest of the poem splits along these two themes of joy and danger. There is a section filled with joy about the words or instruction of the Lord, and there is a section warning of the danger also involved, because the instruction of the Lord exposes the sin in the human heart. The Lord's instruction is perfect restoring life. The Lord's testimony is reliable, making simpletons wise. The Lord's commandments are just, causing the heart to rejoice. The Lord's command is flawless, giving light to the eyes. Fearing the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The Lord's rules are true, they are altogether right. Those which are more desirable than gold, even much pure gold, and sweeter than honey, even virgin honey from the honeycomb. All of the lines in the section about the Lord's instruction have a similar structure. They use language that closely follows a set pattern. The order we see in the lines models the order we see in God's word. The pattern of this structure follows the same structure of creation in Genesis 1, which was already heavily alluded to in verses 2 to 7, when David discussed the sky and the sun. In the creation account, days one, two, and three of creation parallel days four, five, and six. The spaces created in the first three days are filled in the last three days with the creation of corresponding heavenly bodies and living creatures. So too, in these verses of Psalm 19, the first three lines, restoring life, reliable, just, Parallel the next three lines, light to the eyes, enduring, righteous. Then, the structure of the word order becomes less rigid as the poet remarks on the desirableness and sweetness of God's instruction. This final verse reminds us of the seventh day of rest after the six days' work of creation. God delighted in the goodness of everything he created just as the poet delights in the goodness of God's instruction, which is desirable and sweeter than honey. This allusion to creation and this move from highly structured lines to a more loosely structured closing line poetically communicates an idea. Not only is the instruction of the Lord beautiful in its order, but God's instruction also creates order within the world, and we celebrate and rest in the goodness of this result. The order it creates is strict and perfect, but it is also the most desirable possible. There is no conflict in being both perfect and sweet. The picture of the poet in this section that comes out is of a simpleton. If he were left alone, he would become weak, tired, and discouraged. But since he has the Lord's instruction, he becomes wise, and his well-being is secured. The Lord's instruction is perfect, reliable, just, flawless, pure, and true. 
putting each of these six descriptors together to create one picture, we can say that this central section of Psalm 19 is about God's covenantal instruction, which he gives to his people to teach them what to do and what not to do, to teach them how to live as his people. Being instructed with wisdom is a state included in the idea of fearing the Lord. This is the detailed picture the psalm gives us of the word of God. Verse 9 brings up injustice. A person who saw or experienced injustice would normally become sad and weak, which is what it means to have eyes become dim. But when a person studies and keeps the Lord's commands, it brings joy. Because the Lord's command is flawless or bright, it gives light to the eyes. Restoring light to the eyes is a picture of restoring joy and life. Throughout Hebrew wisdom literature, fearing the Lord is a phrase that summarizes living devoted to the Lord and his instruction. The one who fears the Lord is the one who keeps his commands. Those commands are pure and endure forever, which makes them trustworthy, desirable, and sweet. Verse 11 does not follow the same rigid pattern of the sentences before it, but it is still closely tied to verse 10 by the grammar used. All those rules, commands, and testimonies are not hard or frightening. They're more desirable than gold and sweeter than honey. The poet does not hold anything back in his praise, something that stands out strongly in contrast to the tight, restrained structure of the previous verses. It is as if David is reminding himself, Yes, my soul, you must remember that the Lord's instruction is more desirable than gold, even much pure gold, the purest substance known. This is the greatest pleasure of all. The last section, the words of my mouth, begins in verse 12. Furthermore, your servant is warned by them. There is great reward in keeping them. Who can discern his mistakes? Clear me from the guilt of hidden sins. Also, prevent your servant from committing presumptuous sins. Do not let them rule over me. Then I will be blameless and innocent of great crime. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable before you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Verse 12 begins to explain why the poet has so carefully created a picture of the universal and never-failing reach of the sun and compared it to the instruction of the Lord. Like the sun, the Lord's instruction reaches everyone everywhere day after day, it even reaches into the human heart, where it warns by exposing sin. With the warning, however, there is the hope that those who turn from their exposed sin and keep the commandments will be rewarded. The images of the bridegroom representing joy and warrior representing danger for the unprotected prepare the reader for this section. The joy that comes from the Lord's sweet and desirable instruction contrasts with the sense of danger or threat for those who become vulnerable when the Lord's instruction exposes their sinfulness. Even after finding and studying the Lord's instruction, the psalmist still needs to do something about the things he missed, the things he cannot see himself, and the sins that threaten to rule over him. The rhetorical question of verse 13 expects the answer, no one can discern mistakes on his own. People cannot perfectly know and apply the Lord's instruction. When someone intentionally and rebelliously does something wrong, that is a presumptuous sin. David describes presumptuous sins with the strong image of an enemy ruler. In the ancient world, there was no democracy. Rulers had power to command their subjects to do whatever they wanted and subjects had no choice but to obey. David is afraid that he might not be powerful enough to resist the presumptuous sins that want to command him like an enemy ruler, and so he asks the Lord for help. As he faces these three kinds of sins that threaten him like enemies, 
even though he has devoted himself to the Lord's instruction, he prays a prayer with a new image. This image is of an acceptable sacrifice, blameless and pleasing to the Lord. If the Lord cleanses David from his sin, then David himself will become blameless and innocent, and his words will become acceptable. The entire psalm relies on this core belief. If the Lord clears David from guilt and protects him from all sin, then David will be blameless and acceptable, and he will be able to keep the Lord's instruction and enjoy the reward that results from God's order. David the king has a covenant relationship with the Lord, which secures his hope. The Lord has promised to be faithful if the king turns away from his sin. The goal of the Lord's instruction is that David himself, represented by the words of his mouth and the meditation of his heart, that he be pleasing and acceptable to the Lord. This third section ends the psalm in a wonderful poetic way. In verses 8 to 11, the name of God, represented by the letters YHWH, appears six times, one less than the number of perfection. In this final verse, the name appears a seventh time, poetically marking that the psalm is complete and perfect. Studying the instruction of the Lord and then praying prayers to repent makes David acceptable. David shows he is confident that God will accept him using the final two images. The Lord is his rock and his redeemer. The rock was a large rock which could provide shelter to someone in danger who needed to hide. Like a safe rock, the Lord would protect David from the danger of his enemies, the many kinds of sin. The redeemer was someone who could rescue another from an enemy's power or from difficult circumstances. This gave the Redeemer the right to rule over the person that was rescued. The Lord rescues David from his sins, declares him to be innocent, and restores him to an acceptable state. Then, David becomes an acceptable sacrifice because he meets the standards of righteousness in the Lord's instruction. This completes our section-by-section walkthrough of Psalm 19. We'll finish now with the reading of the text that brings everything together. For the Director, a psalm by David. The sky is declaring God's honor, and the firmament is telling about the workmanship of his hands. Day after day pours out speech, and night after night imparts knowledge. There is no speech, and there are no words whose sound is not being heard. Its verse line has gone forth throughout the whole earth, and its words have gone forth throughout the edge of the world. He has set up in it a home for the sun. And he is like a bridegroom coming out of his tent. He is glad like a warrior to run his course. His starting point is from the edge of the sky and his turning point is at its edges and nothing is hidden from his heat. The Lord's instruction is perfect, restoring life. The Lord's testimony is reliable, making simpletons wise. The Lord's commandments are just, causing the heart to rejoice. The Lord's command is flawless, giving light to the eyes. Fearing the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The Lord's rules are true. They are altogether right. Those which are more desirable than gold, even much pure gold and sweeter than honey, even virgin honey from the honeycomb. Furthermore, your servant is warned by them. There is great reward in keeping them. Who can discern mistakes? Clear me from the guilt of hidden sins also. Prevent your servant from Committing presumptuous sins, do not let them rule over me. 
then I will be blameless and innocent of great crime. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable before you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Thank you.